backwards on that. But, you know, you're talking about Ted Simmons. He can hit. He's a switch hitter. You know, uh, they always said, you know, about his throwing. They always said about his catching. You know, you got to remember, Ted caught a lot of ball games, and he also caught a lot of ball games on that turf. Mm -hmm. And that turf was hot, oh, yeah. you know. And it was not it was not very forgiving at all. And, you know, he went out there and he battled. He did it for 20, over, you know, 20 years. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, nothing against Thurman Munson. He was a great ball player. But, you know, you know, you know the Walrus, he was a little bit tubby and everything. He was on the last years of his, you know, stuff. He wasn't going to last 20 years. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to last 15 years, even. Yeah. yeah well. But I'm just saying. Well, yeah. You know, and uh, people, knew, people knew that. Well, Astro so, Turf I mean, is obviously I mean, people in the game knew that. I'm not talking about fans, right? But, yeah, Astro so. Turf is tough. I mean, you're right, Mark. I mean, anytime you play on basically Astro Turf on top of cement is really what you're looking at. I mean, think about Andre Dawson. Here's a guy that uh, went to Chicago and said, "Fill in the check here. I'll yeah. be more than happy to play." And you know, uh, uh, playing at Wrigley MVP. Field during the day on natural grass versus. Our, uh, you know the difference between those two surfaces. Heck, you know what? When you were in Kansas City, uh, Kauffman right. Stadium had Another AstroTurf, one. too. So it's not an easy surface to play compared to natural grass. St. Louis is the hottest turf of any – it's the hottest city, actually, for any uh, uh, baseball. You know, yeah. For baseball, it's the hottest. Right. And people will tell you that. And uh, you got you got those two rivers right there. You've got it, humidity coming out the butt. <laughs> and you you just go outside and you just start sweating. I mean, I grew up in Missouri, southern Missouri. So I knew what humidity was all about. That's probably why I did okay. You know, when my arm was healthy and everything, the heat didn't bother me too much. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's amazing. You know, Teddy's behind the plate and he's catching a lot of good pitchers. And uh, he's trying to control that game. And that's the biggest job that Teddy had to do right there. If you ask a catcher, how you know you got a good catcher is, is when he doesn't talk so much about his hitting. He talks about, you know, the pitching staff. He, he said, my, my goal is to be, you know, basically bring the staff through the season. You know, and that, that's when you know you got a good one. And that's what Teddy did. Right. So. so let's touch a little bit on the um, recent players who were inducted as well. We touched on Marvin Miller, and, I, and your insight on Ted Simmons is equally funny and heart, heartfelt. So let's talk a little bit about Derek Jeter and, you know, your thoughts of him as a player, and then we'll touch on Larry Walker as well. Yeah, well, you look at Derek Jeter, and he was the five six hole guy. That's how, I, how a lot of all players, you know, look at Derek Jeter. You know, you, you say, well, who's the five six hole guy? Well, the five six hole guy is the guy from in, third and short. He, he, you know, Jeter, Jeter had, was blessed with a really good arm. So he cheated to the five six. he cheated to the third base side, and when he got those balls over there, he can make that play with mm -hmm. that dynamite arm of his. And he had range because he was a pretty big guy. You know, so his, his footwork was, you know, well above norm. Uh, and then, you know, he could put the bat on the ball. He knew what to do with the baseball, you know, according to the scoreboard. And the scoreboard, once again, will tell you how to pitch and play a baseball game as well. Absolutely. So, you know, if you got a four-run lead, you got a one-run lead, you're down two runs, it's all different what you got to do at the plate. And also, as a pitcher, what you got to do. And also, the the defense, what they have to do. You know, and, you know, if they if they shift and move with two strikes and, and all kinds of things. And the scoreboard, it comes back to simplicity. Uh, the scoreboard tells you how to pitch and play a ball game. It's, it's that simple. And you had you had extensive years of coaching, you know, following your playing days, and I know you coached in the 90s right. in the minor leagues. Jeter came up from 92 to 95 with the Yankees. Did you have a chance to see him when he was a raw? I mean, there was one in 1992, not many people know this, he made 56 errors at shortstop in one season. I mean, that's like dead ball era defense. Did you ever have a chance to see him play coming up in the minor leagues when you were coaching with Kansas City? Well, matter of fact, I did. Uh but I did, it wasn't in the States. I was over in uh, Australia, and he was playing and getting some work over in Canberra. And uh, that was uh, they had some Yankee players in Canberra at the time. And I was watching this guy work out, and uh, they were doing a drill with this guy, and I said, that's pretty interesting. You're like, I like that drill. And uh, it was Jeter, you know, they were working with at the time. 
So we, we played them in a, you know, a three game set on weekend and then we flew back and, you know, he didn't, you know, jump out at you. He just knew that, you know, the guy had, you know, some tools and you could, you know, I could see this drill that he was doing. And, you know, of course, two years later, he's in the big leagues. Yeah. You know, playing under Bucks or Walton. that, actually. A year and a half later, actually. Yeah. So he came on fast. And, you know, a lot of your good players, I mean, I remember Escobar, for instance. Uh, uh, I had Escobar with Kansas City, um, and he made an incredible amount of errors in rookie ball. Mm -hmm. But he came on fast, and, and um, you know, he focused, and he, he did his thing, and he grew into that body as well. So that's another thing. You know, you got late bloomers. And, and Jeter at that time was a late bloomer. Escobar was a late uh, bloomer. And then once they matured and uh, they were focused on what they were to do, you know, the task at hand, they they competed and they competed well. So when we th interesting when we tend to think of guys in certain sports that personify certain characteristics, I guess you, you, when you think of winning, you think of in football, you think of Tom Brady, in basketball, you think of Bill Russell, both on the court and then as a coach. Derek Jeter, I guess, is the equivalent of that. But, Mark, personally, if I were to ask you, if I were to have you describe Derek Jeter in one word, what word would you use to give me to describe him? Well, I like the word consistent because he showed a lot, a lot of consistency. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's the one. And we had, Consistency and longevity work hand in hand almost to me. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at your guys like, like say, Bob Gibson, you know, and Bob Gibson was out there, and he was durable for how much he threw, how many baseballs he threw, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he threw a lot of pills. And then oh, there's a lot of guys like that. You look at Jim Cott. Yeah. You know, all those guys are you know, Hall of Fame guys, borderline Hall of Fame guys. You know, they have their own program. They know what they have to do. They're blessed with a God-given body that can perform and is consistent on a daily basis. They go out there and they can do that day in and day out. You know, uh, in Jeter's case, 100, you know, 60 games a year, maybe 150 games a year if he's hurt, maybe 140 games if he's hurt. But he's not going to be off the field very much. He's going to be pretty darn consistent uh, between the lines with what he does. So, and do you, would you like to embellish a little bit on Larry Walker? This was his last year of eligibility, and he actually just made it by six votes. Me and Scott at discussed this ad nauseum prior to the show that we thought Larry Walker should have been in the Hall of Fame a long time ago. You obviously never played against him being that he debuted at the, the tail end of the 1989 season, but from watching sure. him all of those years, you know, what was your impression of a guy who, in my opinion, is one of the more complete players in baseball history? Well, you know, the unique thing about him, <clears throat> he's got about, I think, I think he had 2,160 hits mm -hmm. through his career. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the fact that, you know, he could go in there like day in and day out for 17 years and, and get it done. Yeah. But he was also a Canadian. And he's only one of two Canadians. He had Ferguson Jenkins mm -hmm. and, and him now. That's a good point. Uh, you know, that you know, they hold that, uh, that I want to say title. Because <laughs> it is a title if you've got only two Canadians that are working out there. And, and you know, they... Uh, they're, they're sitting out there. That's pretty. That's pretty neat. You can go into Canada and say, "Well, I'm a Hall of Famer." You know, there's, you know, they're, they're mostly out of this country, uh, you know, right now. But that, that's pretty cool. But he had to endure, and I'm sure he had. It's hard for uh, a foreign player to come in to this country and play our game, mm -hmm. and you know, all, all of a sudden he's at the top of the game, and and uh, he's setting standards uh, of his own, you know, which is. And he, and, he's, and he, too, like any other Hall of Famer, is showing that consistency and discipline as well. So, you know, you could throw all those buzzwords out, but I really do like the word consistency with I, these guys. They're day in, day out. And I think you're they right. Show up, they show up. I, yeah, let, let me talk for a moment about Derek Jeter. And it, I, today he was one vote shy of unanimous. And... He, do you think that being one short vote shy of unanimous bothers him realizing that we 
on the surface, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody from the Boston area is the guy that kept him from getting the unanimous vote. Or it doesn't really matter. I don't think it really bothers him that much. Uh, you know, I think he does this. Like, I noticed that one thing he said that he was, uh, it's not, it's like Yogi said, it's not, the game's not over till it's over. Right. And I think he was always like leery of the vote himself. Well, and no. uh, I think he knew he was probably had a chance of getting, you know, the, the, the total shebang right there, but he didn't. And, you know, he's a day-in and day-out player, and you got to remember he came out of Yankee Stadium and he got booed too as well. Right. You know, no matter, you know, matter, you know who you were in right. that stadium, you know, if he failed to get a guy over, get a guy in, and his last at bat, you know, you were going to hear you suck for sure in that old dialogue. You know, but I'm sure there was some some dickhead out there that you know didn't <laughs> want to cast that vote for him. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. you know. I know. I, you know what? Yeah, Yogi Berra, as we both know, Mark had a lot of great lines through the years. That's for sure. And you know exactly. what? It'll be interesting the next time we come on where that vote actually has because now the manhunt is on for the lone Mohegan that turned out to be the big moron. You know. And decided right. to uh, say that 99.9% versus 100% makes him look like a you-know-what and a you-know-what. Okay. Well, he's like an assassin. Don't even bring his name up in the paper for even doing that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Less attention, you know. Yeah, good and, luck uh, trying to do that know, with social media, putting pressure on Mark. You know, social media, Twitter is all going to drag you know, it out of him. They'll get it one way or the other. A ball player, a ball player. You know, really, we don't care sometimes. You know, that's the way you got to play the game anyway. Like, right. kind of like, don't care. You really do care, but you don't because that's the way you you got to play your game. I don't, I don't really don't care. Hey, this is what I got today, and this is how I'm going to beat you. Yeah. You know, today. <laughs> and yet, ironically, in back to back years, Mariano Rivera gets a hundred percent, but Jeter doesn't. You know, you know, everybody right. knocks Derek Jeter's defensive abilities but you know what when you make arguably one of the best defensive plays in postseason history diving into the stands on a big stage nobody knows better what it's like to compete on a big stage than you because obviously you did so you save your best defensive moments when it matters when a lot more people looking at you instead of that thing in the stat column called errors with a few extra that's true yeah I mean you know the the big stage, either, well, we both know that it'll either make you or break you. I mean, I can tell you a story a long time ago when I, when Grady Little was the manager of the Dodgers and I went up to Vero Beach and I asked him if he had to do it over again about leaving Pedro in or not. Said, no, I don't really. It's just that happens on the big stage. Things go ahead and get magnified a lot more. Grady Little, I'm sure you got to know Grady Little, right? He, mm-hmm. he was one of the most yeah. candid guys out, out there. I, I like Grady myself. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's to the point, you know, get the job done, get her, and, you know, same thing with the players, and leave them alone, let them play, and uh, right. if you can't play, he'll find somebody else that can. <laughs> All right, so we, we wanted to touch a little bit, too, on some of the guys that just missed. Obviously, we're going to get to Bonds and Clemens, but we'll, we'll stick with your position first at pitcher. And we'll talk a little bit yeah. about Kurt Schilling. Obviously, Fox News has a spot open for him whenever he wants to go on there. But I think, you know, his spot in Cooperstown shouldn't have anything to do with his political views. He got 70% of the vote. As you know, Mark, you need 75% to merit induction. Right. Give us your thoughts real quick on Schilling and, you know, your reaction to the fact that it hit now in his eighth year of the ballot, he didn't get enough votes yet again. Yeah. Well, he obviously had a great year, uh, he had great years, mm-hmm. uh, and, and he did a lot of damage, you know, in in the postseason. Mm-hmm. Obviously, big time damage, and uh, he, he he could pitch. You look at Maddox, for instance, Maddox, Hall of Famer, and you know you sit there and you look at somebody like Maddox, and he had just incredible stuff uh, seasons, but he had tough time on the postseason. Good, yeah, uh, a That's lot true. of times. Mm-hmm. And then you put Schilling out there between the lines, and it was uh, it was reverse. And uh, but you know, I'm not real sure how many how, how much longevity he he had out there. Uh, do you know uh, 
Yeah. Lewis or he, I mean, but. listen, if you really want.